the supernatural. Now, the brightest light in the natural world is the sun. At noonday, this is noonday, midday sun. But he saw a light brighter than, brighter than the brightest light in the physical world. And he, so this is a supernatural event above what is natural. This is not uh, the sun is brighter than the sun. A supernatural thing is happening here to him, shining round about me, and then which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, that was his name, uh, means one who destroys. Why do you persecute me? Why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. In other words, it's hard for you to go against the thorns. And I said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Very interesting. He was persecuting those who believe in Jesus, and Jesus took that very personally. Uh, but rise, and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared to thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of the things which thou hast seen, and of those in which I will appear unto thee. In other words, you will tell about what you've seen, meaning this event right here, and in the things in which I will, he says, I will in the future appear to you, delivering you from the people and from the Gentiles. Gentiles just means anybody outside the Old Testament people of God. People like us, in other words. Unto whom I now send thee. Why, did he, why is he sending Paul, or Saul, who changed his name to Paul? Verse 18, to open their eyes. And we sang that this morning, didn't we? Open the eyes of my heart. I think we sing a lot of times, don't really think about what it is that we're saying or singing, but here's what it means. To open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified. Sanctified means to make holy. Sanctified by faith that is in me. Now he tells Paul that I'm appearing to you and I will appear to you in the future and I'm sending you to the Gentiles. In the Jewish world, these were the outsiders. Everybody else, in other words. And that's what we are. We are the, those outsiders. We are uh, not part of the Jewish nation. We are those outsiders. Paul was sent by Jesus to people like us. And he was given information about what to say by, we might say, by supernatural revelation. When Jesus appears and speaks in a vision like this, in something that's not physical, that's supernatural, uh, that's a supernatural revelation. In other words, he didn't get it by studying, and nobody told it to him. He got it directly from Jesus. He got information. So when Paul then went around and began to preach, and then when he began to write letters to the people that he preached to, you know, Paul, when he went around and began to preach, he had a very simple message. And it wasn't a message of self-improvement. And it wasn't a message of try to do better. And it wasn't a message of turn over a new leaf. He had a very simple message. When he was imprisoned himself for preaching, and uh, God sent an earthquake and opened the prison, we read about it in Acts chapter 16, the jailer, thinking everyone had fled, uh, was going to kill himself. And Paul said, do yourself no harm, for we're all still here. And the jailer, it says trembling, came before him and said, what must I do to be saved? Saved meaning to be uh, right with God, to be accepted with God, rescued, in other words, from my present condition. What must I do to be saved? And Paul said, listen to how simple he could make his message. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. See how simply he makes that? It, it, no, there's a lot of you know. He could be very long-winded. He could speak at great length. He could speak for hours. But the essence of what he had to say was one thing: our human obligation, as it pertains to God, is to believe in, or to put our trust in, or to put our faith in the Savior. Now, I said a moment ago when, when you have the mindset that I I am trying to improve my life, I am trying to redouble my efforts, I am trying, I am trying, I am trying. That exhibits a trust in oneself. To believe in Jesus means to transfer your trust from yourself to Him. To transfer your confidence from yourself to Him. To transfer your faith and your reliance from yourself to Him. So that now, as it pertains to God, our trust, if we're Christians, if we believe in Him, if we put our faith in Him, we can say, my relationship with God rests upon Jesus. And what I, my part in that is to trust wholly and completely in Him. That makes sense so far? Yes. Yeah. So, how then, and, and that's a good message. I don't know why anyone would think that's a bad message. <laughs> because that takes away all of the, 
you know, what it does is it takes away all of the, uh, the potential fear. You know where fear comes from in relation to God is the fear that I'm not going to be accepted, I'm going to be rejected because of my flaws, because of my faults and failures. Listen, if you examine your own life long enough, you will find faults and flaws. You will find things where you can say, I should have done this, but I did that. I should have said this, but I said that. I didn't do what I should have done, or I did do what I shouldn't have done. You can find those things about your life. And if you are trusting in yourself, you will always feel, even if they're small things, even if they're trivial things, the smallest thing can make you feel disqualified before a perfect God. But to trust in Jesus means I am relying on Him as my Savior, and I'm not even going to think about myself to the extent that I can. Now that's more of a challenge uh, than it, easier said than done. Now that's a good message. I think that's a good message. And that takes away, if you allow it to, the fear of rejection and the fear of future uh, being in trouble with God. But what some people then object to, the reason some people object to that and the fault they find in that is, well then, what is my motivation? Why? What will motivate me then to live in a right way, in a good way? Well, that's a good question. I think that's a worthwhile question to consider. Uh, and let's look at Galatians chapter 2 just for a moment. And I just want to consider that for a moment. How do we live then the Christian life? If the Christian life consists of faith in Jesus and believing in Him, and then believing that our life is acceptable to God because of nothing more than our faith in Christ. Here is the Apostle Paul talking about his own life. Now I'm going to read verse 20, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, and I'm going to do a very strange thing. I'm going to read this verse backwards. Not really backwards. I'm going to read the last part first, and then we're going to talk about the first part. I would like to look, look at the beginning of this. <laughs> Sorry about that. I bet that won't even help with it. Uh, in the middle of this verse, it says, the life which I... And, let's start right there. Notice what he says. And the life which I now live in the flesh. Now when he says the life that I now live in the flesh, he's talking about the life that I live in this physical body. Does that make sense? In, in other words, in my ordinary life, how do I live? That's what he's going to talk about. The life that I live in this, you know, as we say sometimes, where the rubber meets the road, in this everyday life. Not necessarily as we're sitting in church on a Sunday morning, but out in the other six days of the week as I'm out there in ordinary, everyday uh, life on planet Earth, rubbing shoulders with people that may not be Christians. It's easy to be a Christian in church on Sunday morning. It's easy to be holy here. But out there in the flesh, that's what he means by that. So he says, the life that I now live in the flesh, he tells you the essence of how he does it. He says, the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith. Now notice, when, he, when I quoted to you what he said to the Philippian jailer, what does it take to be saved? He said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. The first verse I read to you in John chapter 1 said, as many as received him, to them he gave the privilege to be the sons of God, to as many as believed on his name. Remember that? You see, the essence of it is faith or believing, transferring our confidence and our faith from ourselves to him. And he says, the life that I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Or I think it's fair to say faith in the Son of God, by my reliance upon Him. But he doesn't just stop right there. He doesn't just say that, period. He doesn't just say, I live by faith in Jesus. He makes it a little more specific. He tells you something about Jesus in which he's relying. He says, the Son of God, meaning Jesus, listen to this, who loved me. See, I think that's very important. He says, the way I live in my everyday life is by faith in a continual, not just something I did back then when I first became a Christian, but a continual reliance upon Jesus. And then he says, Here it is, here's what's important to me about Jesus, upon which I rely, that he loved me. Now, we could say, as John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world. Isn't that right? Uh, we could talk about how God loves everybody. But Paul here is not so concerned about everybody else as his own life. He says, the life that I personally live in the flesh. And he says, I rely upon the fact that Jesus knows me and loves me personally. That's <laughs> the microphone. He loves me as a person. And you could think that about you too. He knows you. 
and loves you as a, and 